So, all right, we are live. How's it going, Cam? Doing well, Steve. How are you? I'm doing great, man. So, for those of you joining, welcome to the uh, latest episode of Rocket MSP Podcast. We are trying something a little different. We're going live again, like we used to. We're bringing it back, baby. <laughs> so, uh, so today I am joined by Cam from Alert Ops. You guys may have heard of Alert Ops. It is a really neat platform. Uh, why don't you why don't you tell us a little bit about what Alert Ops does, Cam? Yeah, absolutely. So Alert Ops is on call plus, right? There's a bunch of on call solutions out there for notifications after hours, but they're heavily fragmented. So what Alert Ops really does is provide a set of tools that one facilitate that on-call functionality, but two, tie it together to your process. So from a standpoint of being able to field incoming customer calls to a deeper integration with your PSA and tying that into the on-call process. And I like to consider it as a holistic digital switchboard, if you will. We get signals in, we send signals out, but ultimately the magic is in the middle. Right. So when we get these signals from monitoring tools, from ticketing tools, incoming customer calls, then we apply business logic that you can configure as far as how you'd want to route the notifications, how you'd want to escalate uh, the way that you might want to interact with your PSA, maybe automatically open a ticket or update an existing ticket and then uh, essentially push that out to the appropriate party based on the message, based on the type of issue, things of that nature. OK, so I'll be honest that that still doesn't tell me what it does mm -hmm. as yep. as crazy as that sounds um mm -hmm. i think i think my problem is i need like an example mm -hmm. absolutely so let's say that you are inundated with uh password reset emails and it's 2 a.m and you're the technician that's on call for this week at 2 a.m mm -hmm. You wake up or you're staring at your service board all night just waiting for a P1 to pop up. And that's kind of what the culture of on call has turned into today. So what Alert Ops would do is we would ingest everything that's coming out of your PSA system. And based on the logic that you've said, maybe you only want to be alerted for an offline server and receive a notification for an offline server after hours. We would send you that notification via SMS, via phone call, push notification, virtually any channel beyond just email. So you don't have to be awake staring at the service board all night throughout the course of your on-call shift. So if a P1 does happen, then you know that you have the means to receive it via another uh, communication channel that will wake you up. Now, beyond that, let's say that uh, you're very, very tired. You manage to knock out and you don't respond, even if the phone is ringing at full blast. At that point, automatically escalate it to the next person. Maybe if it's a P3, you want to ring consistently for 30 minutes every five minutes. And the second that it hasn't been responded, kick it up to the next individual, maybe a secondary, maybe a service desk manager. But with the P1, you might want to blast yourself for five minutes before escalation because that has a substantially more stringent SLA there. Sure. Yeah. So this sounds neat. Um, it sounds like uh, maybe the voicemail system of my cell phone could pick up and maybe screw things up. Uh, no. So we actually have the ability to dictate when it's voicemail. So we'd be able to recognize if it's gone to voicemail and we would consider that a missed call, if you will, or saw an unacknowledged notification. So based on that detection, as well as the time intervals that you set up, it would automatically go to the next person. Okay. And what's something like this cost? I, it's I, price I suspect it's reasonable. Yep. Yeah, it's price per user per month um, for okay. the notification pieces. And what really resonates with managed service providers, we have a dedicated managed service provider bundle, and that is 16 bucks a user per month on an annual basis. Um, so fairly low cost for something that really enables uh, the notifications after hours. And that was one six, not six zero. Exactly. One six. 
Okay. So I see on your website, you've got build yearly, build monthly pricing. So it's nice that you give MSPs the option. It also seems like this might be something that is beyond just MSPs, for example. Like, sure, you've got the MSP version, which uh, integrates with specific software, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. Something tells me it's probably ConnectWise and not Autotask. Uh, it's actually both. <laughs> All right. So, so, like, normally, if somebody were to sign up for this, uh, and I see you've got four versions, Starter, Standard, Premium, Enterprise. Mm -hmm. Um are we limited to a number of like integrations with these? So with uh, the premium and uh, the MSP bundle, you can have as many data sources for your integrations, right? We consider that inbound integration uh, stuff that's sending things, sending messages via API, email, et cetera, to alert ops. So those are unlimited. Now on the outbound side, you would have uh, the premium tier one and at the MSP tier, three outbound integrations. So maybe you'd want to talk back to Autotask via API or ConnectWise via API, maybe publish to a status page or alternatively write to the API of uh, in homegrown uh, cloud-based solution. So effectively alert up sending signals out to a third party system once it's received it. So that's an outbound integration and that would be predominantly where the limitation lies. So a workflow to talk back to Autotask, a workflow to uh, potentially add delivery notes in an external system, things of that nature is really where those limitations would lie in this tier. All right. So let's talk about integrations for the MSP. Mm -hmm. um, we, we mentioned ConnectWise and Autotask, but what about all these other platforms out there? Uh, you know, like there's there's Halo and uh, Kaseya BMS, mm -hmm. and then there's there's a bunch of um, uh, gosh, Teams, Slack. Yeah. You know, so so what what all should we expect from from you guys as far as integrations are concerned? So it's fairly comprehensive. Right. And when we jump into the system, I can show you that, too. It's comprehensive okay. in the sense that the way the system was architected, it was heavily focused on the ability to integrate with virtual any cloud based platform. So on the inbound side, we can pretty much ingest or integrate with anything that is capable of making an API call or sending an email. Right. So we have a basic email connector, even for homegrown systems or less mature systems that might not have the ability to make an API call. But as long as a, a, and most web tools nowadays are uh, do have that capability, um, as long as it does, we can go ahead and build an integration with it. On the outbound side, if it has an API, we can build functionality to automate processes via that API. So let's say I sign up and I say, hey, I'm weird. I want you to integrate with Basecamp, mm -hmm. my my project management platform. Let's just mm -hmm. pretend that it has an API. I assume yep. it does, but let's just pretend. So what's it going to take for me to convince you to actually build that integration? Because obviously I'm, I'm just one knucklehead out of hundreds or thousands of clients. You know what I mean? So, uh it actually doesn't take much. And that was kind of the focus of integratability. For us, if we get our hands on a sandbox for virtually any tool or alternatively, even if a client approaches us with an environment that we can configure things with them in, and we would be able to build that integration out and get it templated and in the tool within the span of a couple of hours. Most of the time, the reason that it takes us a couple of days before we push it to the uh, tool is so that we don't have to keep making releases each time we take two hours to build an integration. So from the integratability standpoint, we would very gladly and very quickly, as a matter of fact, throw that tile on uh, the, our website as well as in our application for you to build an integration and configure it. But at the same time, we also have the option for a custom integration. So if let's say that we don't have a template and we're working on getting that template up and running, but you need that Basecamp integration yesterday. 
at that point where you can build out and simply configure that integration and the system is completely no code. So you're not writing curl scripts to make API calls. You're essentially just building it out within alert ops. You grab the URL for the API, plug it into your other system and tell it, send data over to alert ops. After that, what you decide to do with these, each piece of data is completely no code and can be configured by virtually anyone that is moderately technical. Hmm. All right. Well, I feel like, you know, there's there's a lot of other questions I could ask you about the company. Um, let, let's let's dive into that for a minute. So you, your company's based in Chicago area. Where are your developers? Uh, so I'd say our developers kind of a 40, 60 split, right? So 40% out of the Chicago office, we uh, are predominantly remote. So hybrid two days in the office, well, uh, everyone will be in the office. But um, beyond that, the other 60% would be out of our India branch. So we actually have an office in India in Chennai. So that would be where the remainder of our team would be. Okay. So I, I want to pick on you because... Uh, I was on LinkedIn and I saw Alert Ops tagged my my business or me or one of the two, and the the post was very difficult to read. It wow. and then and then I was like, you know what? I bet it was written in Indian and then like translated and then posted on on uh, mm -hmm. LinkedIn. It it was uh, I, I would not recommend that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, duly noted, noted for sure. So I'll definitely take a take a deeper look at that and have a conversation with the team back there. Yeah, yeah. It was it was an interesting post, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, with you integrating into all of these different platforms, I'm not sure if you heard, but cybersecurity is kind of the the buzz these days. Mm -hmm. So, what? What type of protection have you put in place to ensure that our systems are safe? Yeah, absolutely. So for one, we're very rarely querying anything on any one of your servers, right? So if there's an application that's running, Alert Ops isn't of going through your firewall to request data via the cloud. It's your systems sending the information in. So from an alert ops perspective, we wait to receive a signal rather than trying to retrieve the signal from an external system. So we are not accessing anything that exists within your infrastructure without warrant or alternatively without uh, the system sending us something first. Now, with that said, uh, we do have pretty much uh, all of our uh, basic security audits conducted. We do SOC 2 every year. Um, beyond that, we also uh, have all data encrypted, right? Um, at both at rest and in transit when data is being pushed to alert ops or alternatively, if there's another system in the cloud that we're talking to, once again, the data would be encrypted in transit and at rest there as well. And that's good, mm -hmm. but what about the, so so how do you connect to like data RMM? Are we, so are data, we creating sorry, go ahead. Yeah so, yeah, so data essentially would be provided in API URL, right? And mm -hmm. the entire process kicks off when data uses that URL to send a JSON payload, right? Just make an API call using that URL. So data would be so, kind of the trick. So it's not credentials. We're not creating an API user account on our mm -hmm. platform to give you. Exactly. Which, okay. Now, are there any platforms out there that you're aware of that we do have to give like a user or, or some type of permission? Yeah, so that's really more so on the outbound side of things, right? So okay. in the case that we're talking about a ticketing system where you might want alert ops to sit in between a monitoring tool and a ticketing tool. So get something, apply the logic that you've configured in alert ops. Maybe this doesn't warrant a ticket. It is a P4. We don't want it cluttering the service board. Or maybe this immediately should create a ticket. At that point, if we were to create a ticket in Autotask or a ConnectWise via API, at that point, that's really when we would require that API member. 
And for those of you watching live, please don't be shy. Pop some questions into the chat. I'm not going to sit here and pretend to be some kind of security expert. So if there's something I'm missing as I ask this stuff, you know, keep us honest, all right? Um, so with with setting up the, the outbound, now mm -hmm. we have to start talking about creating credentials for alert ops to be able to sign in and do the things. Mm -hmm. That is where I think <clears throat> some security conscious MSPs are going to have problems. And at that point, you know, maybe they just don't use alert ops for outbound stuff. I don't know. But are, are they able to lock it down to where all you can do is update and create tickets? Because that's the one thing I hear MSPs complain about a lot is, you know, some of these tools that they sign up for, they're like, oh, yeah, we can't figure out why it doesn't work. Just give our API full admin access. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And I hate that. Right? I, I absolutely uh, abhor the notion that when in doubt, admin is the best route. Like, I, I think that I've seen that a little bit too many times. Um, with that said, yes. Right. Alert ops in our documentation for most of the tools that we have outbound integrations with and require API keys or some level of credentials, we would recommend the level of a control or entitlements that are provided to that member. So even, for example, with ConnectWise, if you go through our documentation, very explicitly lists out for your API member what objects you would want to allow this API member uh, to actually access. And by default, we restrict that purely to the configuration of webhooks to send data to alert ops and then tickets. Right. Very rarely do we expand beyond that. We do have some interesting use cases that clients request and then we'll work with them to enhance uh, specific to their environment some level of access for that particular use case. For example, while generically we work with service tickets, there was something that popped up for change management that occurred uh, a couple of weeks ago. So we deviated from the best practice, or I guess norm, if you will, of by default going and only providing access to service tickets to then now allowing change tickets to be included in that entitlement as well. Got it. So that seems reasonable. Uh, okay, I'll give you that. Uh, what about our RMM? Uh, is there anything that people would do outbound into the RMM? Very rarely that I've seen, right? There's not much from an RMM perspective that anyone's really outbounding or making an API call to. There have been some level of inquiries just around automation use cases. So I know that some RMMs now are really emphasizing auto remediation for uh, some level of a script that might run to try and remediate the action before it is uh, kicked out with a notification. So there have been requests for us to be able to trigger those automations on demand. Now, we do have the capacity, but at the moment, we're kind of taking it on a case-by-case -case basis, don't have anything templated, purely because of the same reasons that you were mentioning, right? There exists some security concerns, especially when that RMM is sitting on a particular server um, that we don't want to access, right? Uh, if anything, Alert Ops is fairly scared to, <laughs> to allow any security breaches to happen. So from that perspective, we're overly protective of even the use cases if Technically feasible is one thing, but is it best practice is a question that we ask ourselves quite a bit. Got it. So for those of you that are maybe a little more security focused, um, looking here on the integrations page, I see, you know, New Relic, Meraki, GitLab, and Splunk are some of the more popular ones. Uh, Logic monitors on there as well. And then for the MSP focus, uh, there's also Teams, Slack. That doesn't seem right. I think I broke your website. There it is. Avic, that's an exciting one. ServiceNow, Manage Engine. So you've you've got a nice you, you've got, you've got a nice little setup here. Let's uh let's dive into the product itself. Yeah, absolutely. So one moment here and I'll jump in to our sandbox and we can get started. Sounds good. So right. while you do that, 
I'm going to get it loaded up here for you. It's it's nothing to write home about when I look at it. You know, your mm -hmm. your website is gorgeous. The platform itself is functional. Yep, absolutely. So uh, and if we have time, I can definitely jump in to uh, the next version of this too, which we're expecting to release mm -hmm. by uh, end of month here. So the we really, for the past two years or so, or two and a half years, focused a lot on functionality. We focused on the ability to integrate, the ability to make integrations easy, but also make them flexible enough to follow your SOPs, because right? that is not necessarily standard from organization to organization. Um, so now over the past six months, we have focused on UI and UX. So we built a completely new set of APIs for uh, external tools to be able to access and control more aspects of alert ops. We built a completely new mobile application with a new UI as well. That was released about three months ago. And the end of this month, we're releasing our new version of the web app, which has substantially better uh, UI and UX there. So to answer your question, uh, noted and be, uh, be sure to check out our new UI when it releases fairly soon here. Great. Cool. So what you see here is really just your dashboard, right? And uh, the, earlier in the conversation, I'd mentioned that AlertOps really acts like a digital switchboard. So here are all the signals that are being ingested by AlertOps and generating alerts. So on the left-hand side, more of an operational overview, top 10 open alerts, open count by priority, the uh, percentage of your alerts within this time frame that fall inside or outside your SLAs. And then on the right-hand side, more of an infrastructure-based overview. Right. What integration endpoints are actually being hit? Uh, what uh, are the corresponding statuses and number of alerts from each integration? In the same capacity, maybe one integration is considered multiple sources. You might have one auto task integration, but 100 different customers and you want to delineate your alerts based on customer as a source. So you can definitely have a thousand foot bird's eye view of that directly from here as well. Hmm. OK. So what I'd like to start uh, without uh, jumping too far into the platform to talk about a little bit is with the actual integration piece. I know that that's something that we spend some time uh, discussing here. So when I jump into our inbound integrations, at this point, you can see a list of a uh, fairly comprehensive list of IT ops, service management and help desk tools that exist within the alert ops uh, ecosystem. So a lot of these tools that you see with uh, Templates are essentially just that. They're templates that allow you to jump in. Let's say I want to create an air break integration. I would select my escalation rule. I will select who this escalation rule should be applied against. And then I can save. For the most basic integration, all I would need to do is now copy this URL and then configure air break to send us a webhook whenever there's an alert. That's hmm. it. You're done with the integration. Now, obviously, there are substantially more that can be done in terms of how do we want this integration to behave? What keywords do I want to take action on? Is there a subset of things that I want to filter out? Do I want to send different types of alerts coming from Airbrake to different people or use different escalation policies? All of those definitely exist, but at the most fundamental level, all it is is leveraging this template and configuring your system to send this URL data. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Awesome. One of the cool things specifically with alert ops and uh, that alert ops specify, like specializes in that other after hours alerting tools generally don't is what we call dynamic routing. It's a bit of a branded term. Um, but ultimately what I mean by that is when you look at alert ops, based on the type of alert, based on the type of ticket, the type of alarm, we can dictate from the exact same tool, different sets of users. So let's say for an organization, uh, you have two separate teams and the organization has an SOP that is uh, standard across the org for any P1 as far as the time frame for escalation. With other tools, you would have to build out two different escalation policies and attach them to each one of your groups. 
And then on top of that, you would build two different schedules to ensure that uh, one follows the critical and one follows the non-critical for the exact same team. With Alert Ops, you don't have that technical overhead, right? You don't have to maintain things in three different places to uh, apply a different escalation policy to the same team. Pretty easily, we can jump into escalation rule override here and based on source data, set up a different policy. So in this case, I have error message, right? Maybe I want error message to include a specific value or match a particular regular expression, and that will kick off a completely different escalation policy. And because that escalation policy isn't tied to a single group, I can do that at the group level, at the recipient level as well. So if a particular field matches or contains a particular value, then I can kick out the exact same escalation policy to a different team or a different escalation policy to the same team. Make sense there? So far. Awesome. So well, it's, we it's starting to get to the point where I'm like, wait, what? But <laughs> that's, that's not your fault. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, from an integration standpoint, too, we're really getting into the nitty gritty around escalation so or around integration. So we can take a, a, a step back here, too, and talk about what makes it work from a functional level. So an inbound yeah. integration is where we're taking in data. But what do we actually do with that data? Right. Uh, one of the most important things about after hours learning and on call is the actual on call schedule. And that is a feature that Alert Ops has here as well. So when we take a look at uh, this particular on call schedule, here we have a simple 10 member team. That 10 member team has one individual on call at any given point in time, and it rotates on a particular interval as well. So after hours rotates on a daily basis, and then we have our business hours schedule. Now, you might be thinking, why on earth would I want to get a text message or a push notification or a Teams message during business hours when I'm staring at the service board? One of the most common ways we see alert ops being used throughout the course of business hours is one, passive automation. So let's say there's an incoming customer call that was unanswered, uh, automatically creating a ticket. Or alternatively, in the case that you receive something from a monitoring tool that doesn't warrant notification, but you still want a record of it, you could go ahead and uh, enter that into your uh, ticketing system as well. Now, another way is for SLA compliance. Nine out of 10 times, uh, service desks are meeting their SLAs specifically during business hours because everyone's staring at the PSA tool. With that said, though, that one out of 10 times can cause a big problem. So we see a lot of individuals setting up SLA-based alerting for business hours. So the second that something is, uh, and often it's very rare, but the second that something is unaddressed and you're uh, coming close to your SLA for acknowledgement, at that point, notify the entire team. So that way someone uh, is going to look at it. There is some redundancy, some safety net that exists even during business hours. All of these shifts and schedules can be exported to Outlook, uh, to Google Calendar via WebCal feed or a static iCal export here as well. Does that make sense? Can you can you hear me all right, Steve? I guess it helps if I unmute. Every every uh, <laughs> webinar, every podcast, I do it <laughs> once. Yeah. So I like that a lot because now now you're saying that we are able to rely on alert ops <clears throat> i don't want to say as a crutch but as as a way for us to ensure we're meeting all of our slas for our clients mm -hmm. this this is just that that extra little oomph that we need you know yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that from a client perspective, too, um, this is actually a conversation that I've had with a few of our alert, op, like uh, alert ops using MSPs, that it for their clients, for their customers, it provides a sense of security, right? That, uh, oh, we used to receive all of our service request notifications via email. And so there's a chance that among the 50,000 emails that I get for my monitoring system and 7,000 emails that I get for schedule reminders, this gets lost. Well, it's not just an email anymore, right? There's always a safety net or a redundancy that allows you to comfort your customers as an MSP that someone's going to look at. Someone's got your back. Hmm. Very cool. 
So we we looked at the integrations. Did we look at the workflows yet? No, not yet. So I think to go through workflows, we want to start at escalation rules, right? So okay. within AlertOps, the concept of an escalation rule really acts as a playbook, if you will. So when an offline server for customer A that's on this tier of service happens, we want to use this particular escalation rules. And I, I, we normally recommend that people delineate their escalation paths, their timelines, along with any workflows that they are executing based on some standard. And quite frequently, that standard is alert type. So offline server, it might be one alert type. Backup and disk space might be another alert type. Um, versus uh, the second method would be based on customer. So the tier of service that you're providing for a specific customer, you are dictating the, what the escalation paths and workflows look like as a byproduct of the tier of service you're providing. With that said, what you see right now is an escalation rule. An escalation rule is generally applied to a schedule or a calendar that we saw and says how we want to notify individuals. So in this case, I've got a primary, a secondary, and a manager, and I can select my wait time between members. So on the right-hand side, we have a nice feature to preview the actual escalation rule if it were applied to a particular group. So in this case, for my Nakatomi Plaza team, it's going to go to my group email, a Slack group, and then my first primary is notified for about uh, 12 minutes before the second primary is notified via both email and phone call and so on. So it, with the uh, contact methods that you see here, that's all fairly easily configured within our rule in itself. So a lot of the users, the dummy users in the sandbox environment only have emails, but we have uh, configured this to go to email, phone, and SMS gateway, or alternatively, we have native SMS as well. So knowing that the gateway can be potentially unreliable, um, as well as pretty much any contact method from a collaboration channel like Teams or Slack to a push notification via the mobile app. You can set up retries and repeats at the individual notification level. So maybe I want to repeat my uh, just my phone personal and wait one minute before I want to go to my SMS. Or alternatively, I want to execute this entire thing and retry that four times every three minutes. So fairly customizable. And what you saw there was a centralized escalation rule. So with a centralized rule, that means you are setting a standard as far as how everyone will be notified. With that said, though, you can switch this to user. A user escalation rule will still allow you to set the wait time between various individuals, but automatically default to whatever contact method preferences they've configured within their user profile. Um, cool. An additional feature here is between primary, secondary, and managers. You can set up three types of roles in the sense that you can have 10 primaries on call at any given time and still have a wait period between them. But let's say you want primaries to be notified differently than secondaries and secondaries to be notified differently than managers. You have the option to set up to three different types of notification methods and escalation paths that you can use to delineate between tiers of uh, response. Does that make okay. sense there from an escalation standpoint? Because I think from that escalation, moving into workflows would be uh, a lot like smoother as far as understanding where they play a role. Got it. Okay. So this is the timeline. This is our linear chain of escalation. So uh, this goes up for 50 minutes and keeps notifying until we hit the manager, Hans Gruber. But throughout the course of that 50 minutes, let's say we want to do something else. Let's say that we would want to turn this linear path into more of a tree, right? It has branches so that as your incident evolves, maybe the priority increased and you want to automatically initiate another set of communications. Or alternatively, maybe someone responded to a uh, ticket uh, or responded to an alert. You'd want to push that into a PSA tool via workflow. Workflows are additional communication layers that allow you to initiate communication with both people and uh, systems via API beyond just that linear branch. So for example, uh, in this particular scenario, I have a couple of different workflows. Create status page IO incident and close pad the status page IO incident. Notify the manager one hour before the SLA if it's not resolved. Maybe someone's acknowledged it, but it hasn't been resolved yet. Notify the owner every hour until it's resolved. So while this is occurring, concurrently, you can have additional workflows that execute based on fairly simple form-based conditions. 
In this case, I'm saying that notify manager one hour before the SLA, if it's not resolved, this is scheduled since it's time-based. If the status of the alert is not closed and then the time before the SLA is 60 minutes, then I'm going to use this rule to go ahead and send out a notification to a particular set of users there. Hmm. So workflows are effectively just enhancements to what would otherwise just be a linear chain uh, of escalation. Does that make sense there? Yeah, I like that. Cool. So and outside of workflows, as I mentioned, escalation rules really do act a lot like playbooks in the sense that we are going to have some additional options. So for certain types of playbooks, you have granular control as far as doing things like outbound actions. Now, uh, I mentioned before that if you have a monitoring tool, let's call it Ovic, right? If Ovic sends something into Alert Ops and you don't necessarily want everything from Ovic to open a ticket and auto task, uh, you can build that logic in to Alert Ops at the inbound integration level. Then if it does warrant a uh, ticket, we'll automatically create one in auto task. Sometimes you need that level of human intervention, though. Very rarely is every single piece of your infrastructure going to be solved based on some simple rule sets. Someone might need to peruse the data of, of an alarm that came in and make the call. This needs to create a ticket. All of these outbound actions here are just that, right? These are... API calls to external systems that allow you to trigger something on demand or ad hoc. Um, if we create a, maybe we see something and want to discard it, just close out the alert. Or alternatively, directly from the mobile app, tap a button to create that priority one ticket rather than logging into your PSA portal and filling out that form. We've already got it. It's just that layer of review that we would need a human for. So making uh, life a little bit easier in terms of the actions that can ta be taken on the fly there as well. All right. The last piece just around escalation rules that I'd want to show you is just going back to that customizability. Um, and this probably looks like a lot here. And the reason is it is. Um, because it is that customizable. So from our basic response actions, acknowledgement, assignment, escalation, escalation, and close, for each channel of communication or enforcing where they're actually visible, are we allowing text to get a phone call and acknowledge via phone call or an SMS or an email or group chat? Um, most of the time, the answer is yes. But in some cases, I've talked to MSP partners that we work with that want none of these capabilities for mobile response. They want multi-channel notifications, but they would actually like the technician to log into their PSA to acknowledge from that standpoint. So they know that there's an interaction with the PSA um, rather than allowing them to do it on the fly. Similarly, in the case that you send back a reply to an alert, hey, guys, I've got this, or hey, would I think that we need to look into this for, for a customer A. You can set up granular response to say when it's escalating, maybe blast them through every channel of communication that exists. But if someone's got it and they're simply replying, send everyone a push notification or just send them a text message. So fairly granular control over how you want the notifications and response actions to be configured there. Any questions just around escalation rules or how they might act in terms of workflows or playbooks there? No, no, this is, this is a lot. Like, I feel like you have enough customization in here that I might need to have like a manual on hand in order to be able <laughs> to use this thing. Um, yep. The, the level of customization is, is amazing though. Yeah, definitely. And that's why when we normally get started with customers, uh, they onboard themselves for simple use cases, right? Starting simple, getting the basic alerting up and running. And then our team would actually go through a process of sitting down and doing an onboarding discovery. So what now that you have the basics up and running, what do you actually want this to do for you in the context of your business? So from there, we would one, uh, put together like a plan for that onboarding, but then additionally provide any resources necessary as well as provide training sessions because uh, it's a powerful tool, but that also means that there's a bit of a learning curve there. And we know that, which is why we assist in that process for sure. Okay. Now, it sounds like, okay, so let me back up a second. For an MSP, this is $16 a month per user. Mm -hmm. 
have have you seen many like one or two person MSPs use this thing, or is it usually larger ones? I'd say nine out of ten times it's larger ones. Um, but we do have smaller MSPs, right? One, two person shops, three, four person shops. And normally those types of MSPs aren't opting for the MSP package. They don't really care about the bi-directional integrations with a bunch of systems. They just want to be woken up when something goes wrong or when they need to. <laughs> so uh, nine out of 10 times, we see those MSPs opting for our standard package. Okay. And that means they're saving some money, which is cool. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a minimum number of users? Because, uh, no, not at all. So we uh, we have accounts where people are just one user. We actually have an interesting account where they don't even get alerted. Uh, they just need some system in the middle to evaluate the logic to determine whether we want to discard this or push it to the ticketing system. And Alert Ops has that logic built into it. So anything from one to a few thousand users, no limitations there. So to clarify, it sounds like that one user is using alert ops to get rid of the, the garbage noisy tickets instead of tuning their platforms to generate notifications that matter. Exactly. And I think that a lot of that really stems from the fact that in some platforms it doesn't exist, right? Uh, the okay. granularity with which we can say, hey, only send this information, but not that. Or even from the receiver's end to say, hey, look for X, Y, Z keywords or look at this particular field. And if it contains this value, then discard it. Um, in a lot of systems, they, that functionality isn't mature enough. So Alert Ops kind of sitting as the middleman solves that problem. Hmm. Now... The, the way that you just described this, you know, some some company using it as as basically a parsing tool. Remember back in the day when Autotask wasn't able to parse emails and you had to use like a, a third party parsing tool? Mm -hmm. I, I feel like this is kind of bringing back that functionality in, in a, some some sense. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And I think that uh, <laughs> while we do focus on the notification and escalation piece of things that, like you said, there is flexibility and customizability enough that the tool is by a lot of customers being used for things that we haven't really positioned it for, but it works for. <laughs> so with the dashboard of alert ops, mm -hmm. can we go back to that now that we've now that we've poked around through the uh, back end a little bit, I think this might make a little bit more sense. Okay. So the thing that I'm, I'm kind of digging about alert ops is right now, this, this is like, I, I could see having a TV screen in the middle of the, of the bullpen where you're using alert ops. And now we don't have to sign up for one of those expensive uh, gauge platforms you guys know what I'm talking about, where uh, where you're spending hundreds of dollars a month just to get some some dashboard gauges up on a screen, because this is kind of doing it for you. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, it's funny that you say that. So we have this view, but additionally, we also have a bit of a list view. And um, we have a few uh, enterprise customers whose NOC teams uh, heavily leverage this view, and they actually have it up on the dashboard uh, and on TV screens across their NOC. And they this page auto refreshes so they can see things as they come in, and they like having this, I think, on something like a 65, 70-inch TV sitting in the middle of their NOC room. That's incredible. So with, with this... Um, I'm, I'm really impressed with the dashboard, with the way that you've configured this. What happens when we'll say Avic or Dato RMM changes something with the way their API works and mm -hmm. now it's no longer functioning correctly? How long, what, what's your SLA like to get that stuff fixed? So uh, from nine out of 10 times, we will see errors on the back end of an API call falls, right? Fails. 
Um, and so immediately we reach out to the customer to ask the customer, because even from a standpoint of uh, the exact same PSA tool, right? Uh, for example, let's say if ConnectWise uh, is an on-premise versus cloud, someone rolled out a patch on the on-premise one or alternatively updated the version. So the API endpoints different. Uh, we will immediately have the information around errors that exist. So within one day, we'll reach out to the client to see if there was any change to the tool or there was an update that was pushed by the tool in itself. And then after that, based on the new spec, it will take anywhere between two to three days to actually get that into a working state and templated in the system for all of our users. But for any users that are currently leveraging it, we can make the change and configure that system pretty much right then and there so that it's working for them. But from a global perspective, it would take anywhere between two to three days for it to actually go live in the system. Now, how... How idiot proof is alert ops? So idiot proof wise, I'd say if the role based access control is set up correctly, very. Um, and making sure that we have clear delineation between what users have what types of roles is critical in making alert ops idiot proof because there are going to be users that have some level of an understanding of alert ops and are just dangerous enough to break everything. So mm -hmm. making sure that the distinction between admins and even types of admins, group admins versus integrations admins versus generic app admins is very well delineated at the start of the engagement, then it's very idiot proof. But in the case that it's not, and I've seen a few scenarios where everyone is made in a global application admin, and that causes some problems, <laughs> especially when down the line, someone has changed something that they're not supposed to, and all of a sudden it impacts more than just their team. So I, I think that um, to answer your question, when role-based access control is configured properly, it's pretty idiot proof. Got it. What what else is there with alert ops that, because I, I know we didn't necessarily go through every single one of these menu items. Is there anything else that is important enough for us to look at? Yeah, I think there's probably a few areas, um, and I'm trying to focus on just the areas that resonate with our MSP audience, but uh, there's also sure. some stuff that resonates with uh, enterprises. So from an MSP perspective, a few things that we uh, see fairly commonly is one, call routing, right? So Alert Ops has a lightweight IVR system built into the tool. We would provision you this phone number so you can provide this to your customers as an incoming service line. And then you can set up a welcome message or you can record an audio message. And then you have either all your calls going to a particular team. So we saw our teams as well as the list of users in that calendar. So if I go back to that calendar here. I love that you're using Nakatomi Plaza, by the way. <laughs> yeah, our uh, VP of technology is a diehard, diehard fan. Um, so in, uh, in here, right, we have a bunch of different tiers of escalation. If we jump into the live call routing instance, let's say we want it to actually go to a person uh, rather than just leave a voicemail. It'll try ringing each person in order of the actual schedule. And then in the case no one responds, allow callers to leave a voice message, generate an alert, and maybe you have an escalation rule with the workflow to send that to a PSA tool. Um, similarly, you can go directly to voicemail and simply just escalate the notification after the fact, saying that there is a notification or a missed call, please attend and then a link to the voicemail that they can listen to. And we also have some flexibility in terms of an auto attendant, right? Based on an incoming selection, we might want to forward to one group and then use an escalation rule that does create a ticket or maybe it creates a P3 ticket versus another one creates a P1 ticket. Um, so you do have the flexibility in terms of routing the call a bit as well. And then some basic settings just around what uh, messages we would like. Now in the case that I select call forward here and then update, Beyond just a recording message, you can call everyone simultaneously, uh, show the caller's ID, uh, caller ID, a waiting message, screening, no response, and recording. So pretty much a basic IVR that's actually built into the tool for fielding incoming customer calls there. All right. So I want to clarify, 
Is this mm -hmm. is this including like dial tone and minutes and all that? Yep. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. How are you able to afford to do that? Uh, so uh, the so actual number in itself is free with the MSP package. And then per month, per account, we give away 100 free minutes. But beyond that, then there is a usage cost per minute. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, what if we like our own phone system? Yeah, then you're more than welcome to use that. And in the case that you would want to leverage the alerting downstream, though, you can definitely allow the phone system to ring through. Nine out of 10 times, they are capable of sending an email. So if it posts an email to alert ops, or better yet, if it's capable of posting to an API, then we can retrieve that and kick off the escalation path uh, using alert ops, but your existing phone system. So you're not by any means forced to use our phone system just because you're using the rest of the system there. Okay. Cool. What and other cool, cool things you have hiding <laughs> under the hood? Yeah. The, I, I'd say probably the last thing um, that I'll jump into in the actual web app is service status. So this is almost like an internal status page. So you can configure services based on whatever hierarchy or topology that you'd like, or you can do it based on customer even and see if there were any incidents that were posted. And these can be tied in with any integrations that you have. So this is concurrently updated. We also have stakeholder notifications. So let's say that your end users uh, want some level of notification, right? So our MSPs customers, as, as incidents occur, they uh, can be added with stakeholder licenses, which are non-interactive users and simply receive communication and updates uh, via email or SMS directly through here, or alternatively via phone call and pretty much any other channel using workflows. Very cool. Now, one other thing that I'll show you that's not necessarily in uh, the Alert Ops web application is our interaction with uh, collaboration tools, right? So here we have a Microsoft Teams environment similar with Slack, and you can directly uh, receive it to a particular channel for specific groups, and you can also reply to them, right? If I, I, we have an Alert Ops bot that if I wanted to assign this particular alert, I could very easily do so. We're actually releasing a newer version of Teams in the next couple of uh, uh, Teams bot in the next couple of months with more interactivity, some buttons you can directly click directly from here. And that are, uh, that functionality already exists for our Slack integration. Hmm. The last thing I'll show you is our Alert Ops mobile app. So here we have the Alert Ops mobile app, fairly basic, predominantly used for response. Um, it tells you if you're on call currently, if you're not, you have the ability to create an alert on the fly and the most important part, view alerts. So in this case, there are no open alerts assigned to me, which is great. Um, I have a list of all of my alerts in here. So the actual message can be customized based on whatever you'd like it to display. Directly from here, we have the ability to filter a little bit based on the priorities, based on the groups that they are going to, or whether they've been assigned or not. Um, we also have the option to close, assign, and take additional context actions, uh, acknowledge, escalate, add another recipient, reply to it, add a note, or execute an outbound action, an outbound action were those on-demand actions that we saw within the escalation rule. If we click into a particular alert here, let's see. Um, you'll get your basic information. You can see any custom fields that have been populated. In this case, none have. We can jump into another alert that might have some more data in there, as well as track the messages, right? Who was notified at what time and how. And you can add messages as well. So serves as a bit of a collaboration tool that you can send out. And then you have a timeline tracking of who was notified at what point, any status changes throughout the course of this alert, et cetera. Hmm. Another nice thing directly from the mobile app is going to be our scheduling feature. So obviously you can see what your schedules are um, if you're on call, but you can add out of office. Let's say that at 3 p.m. today I've got a dentist appointment and I'm uh, supposed to be manning the service desk. I want someone else to cover me. I can pretty easily jump in here, select my start time, end time, and a covering person so that there's always going to be someone that if you need to, uh, on an ad hoc basis, uh, hand off for responsibility temporarily, you can do so pretty, pretty easily. All so right. I think the cool features, yeah, that's, that's, uh, those are the big ones I had for you. <laughs>
I, I like it, man. So how do we get signed up? Yeah, so sign up page uh, would be just alertops.com. If you jump, if you go to alertops.com, you can click on free trial, sign up, and then our sales team will reach out to you. Or if you want to jump directly into a demo before you try out the system, you can click on get demo and reach out to uh, someone from our sales team will reach out within probably an hour to get you scheduled for a demo there. Awesome. Well, Cam, seriously, this is this is good stuff, man. I really appreciate you showing this off today. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any? Uh, I'll ask if you have any last words. <laughs> you have any final <laughs> thoughts that you'd like to share with the group? No, I mean, I think that um, especially having now been, gotten a lot more experience with the MSP community over the past couple of years, um, awesome community. I think that for alert ops, we're constantly growing because we try to keep our ears to the ground, make sure what uh, MSP problems exist, we try to address however we can. So as we grow, we would love our community to grow with us because the way that we improve our product is feedback. So please well, you like it, you don't like it, let us know, and we'll make it better. Awesome. All right, my friend. Well, hey, guys, thanks for popping on and uh, just being here for today's podcast episode with Cam from Alert Ops. And uh, I will catch you guys at the next episode. Take care, everybody.